I don't know how much time passes. The booming sound is long gone. Still don't know what the fuck it's all about. And for the moment, I'm not going to worry. I've got enough shit to deal with. I keep staring at those grooves in the dust. Are they really incontrovertible proof? Was someone else truly here? Yeah, of course someone was. But the important question is, when? This is the Ostium Network, after all. Time is always fucking relevant. So the frame could have been moved, what, years ago, maybe? No. Too long. The dust wouldn't look like that. So weeks, maybe. Months? Possibly. Not too many of them, though. Or it got taken a couple days ago. Or a day. Hours. Minutes. And that's when that fear shoots up inside me again, and this time it drives me to my feet. Yeah, I entertained the idea of staying here tonight. Because it's Steve's place. But now, no, uh, not happening. I'm headed back to my place. It's on the quick ride over in the EV that I realize where I need to go next. The place I need to check out tomorrow. Somewhere I've never been before, even when this place was swarming with people. I can't help looking up at the top of the Rock of Gibraltar as I'm thinking about this. When we get back to my place, Because that's what it is, if you haven't caught on yet. Can't remember if I said that in so many words. But I noticed right away that the front door is now closed. It wasn't like that when we left. I remember. I remember looking back at Jake, watching him make sure it was ajar. I reach up to type in my code to let us in, looking at Jake. He looks just as worried as me. Bloody brilliant. I take a deep breath just as the door unlocks and pops open. I charge up the stairs, ready for anything, and scared of bloody everything. My heart's pounding like I just chugged a pint of very strong coffee. But my worries are all for naught, I discover, once I'm upstairs and looking around. Jake's right behind me, my very necessary backup. But we don't find anyone here. Safe for now, at least. We both let out heavy sighs. Okay, I'm going to throw some grub together. In the meantime, you collect your thoughts and we'll go over what's going on with you. Sounds good, mate. Jake makes supper too bloody quickly for my liking. It felt like I just sat down and then there he was with two plates of steaming food. Pasta and some sort of tomato sauce. Good enough for me. He puts the plates down and I start eating. He returns with a couple of glasses of water and starts eating as well. He gives me at least five minutes, which is very decent of the chap. He gives me time to gobble down my food, let out a very loud burp, and then get settled, nestling the water in my hands. I lied to you before. What? Why? Just, just let me say my piece. I'll explain why, what I mean. I had my reasons. Just listen for now. We'll have a Q&A session after the lecture, okay? Sure, man. I lied about never having been to Gibraltar before. Honestly, my memory has been an absolute pile of shit since we came through here. So I've got that going for me, I suppose. But as more time goes by, the more I feel I remember. It feels like my memory is coming back to me in dribs and drabs. I'm sorry for lying to you, Jake. The first time I came to Gibraltar was on holiday. I was spending a package deal in Spain and thought I'd visit a piece of foreign Britain. There was nothing remarkable about it. It was perfectly normal in every way. I pause, drinking some water, clearing my throat. (coughs) But that was another time, long ago. Jake, I remember being here more recently. A lot more recently. I had no clue at first, 
when we arrived. But as each hour, bloody hell, as each minute goes by, I remember more and more. I remember lots of people here. I was one of many. Thousands, it felt like. And we all had jobs to do. We were working together, learning together. We were in lots of classes, being taught about time and time travel. And... Ostium. How it started. How it got made. How we were going to use it. A lot of the details are still quite fuzzy, but I've got at least a general idea about it all. The gist, you know? Jake's nodding at me, trying to control the shock on his face. Honestly, I can't blame him. I can remember... I can remember the ones in charge asking if I'd like to be the first one to go through. To try Ostium. To get to the town and go through one of the doors. Come back and tell them all about it. We'd been training and learning for months. At least six months, I think. I was so bloody anxious to actually do something. I know I should have thought about it some more. Taken more time and talked about it with my mum. Your mom? Yeah, she was here with me, in Jib. We got hired pretty much at the same time and arrived here on the same boat. Something... Something weird happened when we took that boat. I can't quite remember what, but something... Special happened to get us to this unique place. To this Gibraltar. This island. It's not... Well, I think you know this already, but it's not a normal place. Not naturally occurring, if you catch my drift. Yeah. I know, there's something very similar about this place in Ostium. No bloody kidding. So do you remember what happened? How you got into Ostium? How the whole emu thing came about? Emu? Oh, bloody hell, no. No, I don't remember any of that, yet. Let's see. At the moment, all I can remember is them all giving me the okay and stepping through that door. The one we were looking at earlier, in the funny looking room. The one that looked like a deadly virus containment facility? Yeah, that one. They gave me the okay, and I stepped through, and... I can't remember anything after that. Yet. I really hope it starts coming back to me. It's... It's honestly starting to turn my stomach a bit. I want some fucking answers. I feel you, Dave. I know where you're coming from. Thank you, Jake. It means a lot to hear you say that. And to have you hear it all. I'd be bark as if I was here on my own. But Dave, how can you be so sure that this is the place? You've got memories of it, sure, and you somehow managed to get into this apartment. But you don't exactly sound fully confident of your faculties. How do you know this Gibraltar, this island, is the same place? The moment of truth. I knew it was coming. And this was the right time. Because I didn't do anything special to break into this place. I didn't hack that terminal or randomly type in the exact number. I knew what the number was because I remember setting it when I first moved in. I remember being told how to set the passcode and choosing those random numbers. And they worked. Huh. Okay then. That's not everything though. I also have a piece of undeniable evidence. Jake is watching me intently now. I pull out the small frame photograph from my trousers and put it in his hands. He looks at it, his eyelids half closed, frown lines forming on his forehead. Then the lines suddenly disappear and the eyes become huge egg-sized things and I think they're going to fall out of their sockets. Then he looks up at me and his look makes me feel scared. The sort of fear that makes you feel cold inside. Dave, this is you. I know. And who's the woman beside you? That's my mum. She was here with me, remember? Dave, that's Monica.
I barely remember what I chow down for breakfast. I don't make my bed, even though I did so religiously every morning I was here. I just get myself ready and set out. I did remember to charge the EV last night. It took a little while to work out where everything was, but they showed us how to before. The know-how was still there. So come this morning, it's all ready to go. I take a few minutes to think, to wonder if I need anything for where I'm going. Food? Supplies? Nah, not really. It's not like I'm going to be staying where I'm going. But I do take one important item. The gun. The ride over is a mixed bag. Half of it is lovely. Fresh, clean sea air, a gorgeous sunrise. As that yellow ball climbs higher, it gets deliciously warmer. It makes me feel, for the moment at least, happy, sort of. Happy to be here, in a way. Happy to be somewhere nice for a fucking change. Somewhere I might want to call home. Somewhere I have called home before. Somewhere familiar and comforting. Of course, it's just me here, all by my fucking lonesome. I'd like that to change. Scratch that. I really want some goddamn company here. Anybody would be okay. Someone nice preferred. Oh, well. Enough rhapsodizing on what I don't have, what can't be. Now we've reached the other side of the journey, the half that's more of a question, and I gotta concentrate because I haven't really been in this area much before. They showed us, like, once. Way, way back in the early days. Fortunately, I still remember. It's kind of hidden, too. So I navigate the EV down alleys. Make turns here and there. Just when I'm starting to think I took a wrong one, I see it, standing there. Ready and waiting for someone to use. We call it the cable car. Always have, always will. There's a bunch of damn names for it. Fancy sounding ones like aerial lift. Or scientific sounding ones like aerial tramway. Gondola lift is another. They call it the cable car here, so that's what I called it. It's what we all called it. We all saw it, going up and down a couple times a day. Sometimes lots of times a day. Not that it mattered that much. None of us ever fucking went on it. No, the only peeps that got to ride the cable car were the special ones high up on the totem pole. Got to ride it all the way up to the top of the rock. That's what they told us during that introductory tour. How many of these special people are there? How many of them are white dudes? Those details weren't given. It was also clear it wasn't worth asking. We weren't going to be given those sorts of answers. I watched it, a number of times, the cable car. It was kind of relaxing to do. Watch it make its slow way all the way up there. And each time I did, I thought about who was in the car. What were they like? Were they nice people? Not so nice? Did they even care about all of us down here? I knew then I'd never know. I know now, too. But one thing's about to change. Assuming I can get the fucking thing working. How hard can it be? I try the door to the little house at the bottom of the rock. From its roof erupts two set of cables reaching high up to the top of the rock, like really long strings that have been attached to arrows and shot up to the peak. Yeah, a pretty shitty simile, I know. Jakey's the one for those. Along the way up the mountain are pylons holding up the cables. The door's locked. This stops me for just a few seconds. Guess they usually kept this place guarded or something. The door's nothing special. I lash out with a couple of stiff kicks just to the right of the handle. They cause enjoyable crunching sounds. One more and the door swings open. I step inside a kind of atrium. There are glass doors on the other side that I get open much easier. They open onto the staging area, and there's the cable car looking like something a little bigger than a van, but too small to be called a bus. 
from the top of it extends the connector to the cable above it. Okay, good. There's the important part. The part that's going to get me to the top of the rock. Now it's time to figure out how this sucker works. It doesn't take me long to find the control room. And everything's labeled. Fucking A. Someone was smart in setting this up. Or at least helpful. And what have we here? A damned instruction manual. How goddamn useful is that? And what's this? A quick pointer sheet on how to operate the cable car? I don't mind if I do. I start pressing buttons, turning knobs, and flicking switches. There are groans and creaks, and then things start moving. A humming sound builds. We're in business. I complete the checklist. Think about getting into the cable car to see if I can get it moving and stout myself. Hmm. I keep checking the instruction manual. There's another page with another checklist for operating the fucking cable car while riding it. That page gets torn out and is coming with me. Okay, standing at the door to the cable car. Here goes. I step inside and expect it to move, like a boat on water. It doesn't. Stays perfectly still, like it doesn't even know I'm standing on it. I slide the door closed and make sure it's locked and secure. There's a panel inside the door with instructions on this, too. Damn, they're making this easy. I... I really fucking appreciate it. Thanks, bigwigs. I walk over to the operating station and whip out my cheat sheet. I flick a switch and press a few buttons. Then I hold my breath. Here fucking goes. I press one more button and then put my hand on the accelerator. A big knob with a speed dial above it. I turn it slowly. A digital number tells me my increasing speed. Once it gets past one, the cable car starts moving. I jam the cheat sheet in a cubby underneath the control panel and grab hold of a very well-placed handle next to me. I'm not taking any risks. The cable car moves out of the... station? House? Whatever the fuck it is. And starts ascending. I've regained my balance and my confidence is starting to come back. Good. Not sure about my bravery. I recall the recommended speeds on the instructions and slowly turn the knob. The cable car moves faster, up to 15 kilometers an hour. Not really that fast, but in a glass box on its way to the sky, it feels fucking fast enough, let me tell you. I approach the first pylon and remember the instructions, slowing the cable car down to 5 kph. As the connector above the cable car passes over the pylon, there's a clanking sound and everything shakes. It's normal, the instructions say. It doesn't relax me at all. I'm also remembering one of those X-Files episodes I watched. There were a lot of them. One of the early ones with a guy. Fox, uh, Fox Mulder, wasn't it? Riding a cable car, trying to catch up with someone. He kept pushing the cable car to top speed and barely slowing it down when it approached the pylons. I remember the billboard in this episode. Skyland Mountain, Ascend to the Stars. I ain't going to be taking any of those risks. Past the pylon, the cable car speeds up to a normal 15 kilometers per hour. And now I finally start to relax. I look around through the windows and admire the view of the island of Gibraltar opening up before me. It's quite breathtaking. I'm awake and up. It's a new day in this strange new place. I wake up in a strange bed, but I slept like a baby. It felt really damn good to get to sleep in an actual bed. I know I'd been sharing the bed in Austin with Monica, but there's something to be said about enjoying a queen-size bed all by yourself. And after the last 24 or 48 or however many hours it's been since the blackout swallowed up my world, I really needed a good rest. I feel alive and rejuvenated. 
So it's time to start brooding. Well, not so much brooding, but some deep introspective thinking about... No, it's brooding. Dave is Monica's son. Dave is Monica's son. Dave is Steve. It's a big fucking deal. All that time, all that looking, all that suffering, and he's here, he's found, he's with me. But Monica isn't. And he was Dave all along, somehow. No, I don't get it. Not one bit. I'm not going to try right now. It's too much. Too much to process. Too much to try and comprehend. Dave's... Should I still call him that? Should I tell him his name's actually Steve? And then, why does he think he's called Dave? Anyway, Dave's still sleeping out on the couch. I can hear him snoring. I look out the window and see the sun's making its way up into the sky. It's well into morning. I'm going to need to get Dave up soon. We need to keep checking this place out, see if we can find anything that might help us. Something that will explain all of this, what happened here. I decide I need a breath of fresh air and sneak down the stairs, quiet enough not to wake Dave. I open the front door and leave it ajar so I can get back in with no issues. I think I remember the number Dave said was the passcode, but I still don't really trust all this. Not completely. Outside, the air feels fresh and wonderful. I walk into the street, taking deep lungfuls. It feels so great, waking me right up. I can't help looking at my surroundings, my eyes studying the buildings I can see, then casting over to the rock, following its ascension to the peak. And then, I see movement. What the fuck? I don't understand it at first. It takes some time. Then I realize what I'm looking at. It's the cable car. I can remember that doing some reading when I was younger on Gibraltar and how the town has a cable car that takes you to the top of the rock. You know, to check out the views and the monkeys. So I shouldn't be that surprised to see it there. The cable swooping down the mountain like big electrical wires. Except, except the cable car is moving. I can see it from where I'm standing. It's far away, almost to the top, but it's definitely moving. And that means someone's probably on it just great I get ready to go back inside to wake up Dave to give him the truly great news do I still call him Dave or Steve what's right last night when I told him that that was Monica in the photo he didn't believe what I was saying Dave that's Monica you what You must be bloody kidding. No, Dave, I'm deadly fucking serious. That's Monica in the photo. And I can see you too. That means she's your mom. You're her son. We are talking about the same Monica here, aren't we? The one you've been gallivanting all over the place with? The one who was... Seducing and attacking you with those things so you'd stay in line? Um, The one who was always looking for bloody Steve. Who we all thought was her boyfriend. But who was really her fucking son. Who was really me. Yes, Dave, that is what this all appears to be. Does it? Yes, it's the one thing I've never been able to find out until now. Absolute proof. Undeniable. Unquestionable. What? This? Yes, it's you. It's Monica. In the background is the rock. This place. You were here with her, your mother. And she was also with me. And you, Dave, went on your own journey and you found Ostium. Or maybe it found you. And then you found me. And then we both got here. Where you were before. And when you were Steve. When you were here with your mom. With Monica. Dave's looking down at the photo. I'm not sure what's going through his mind. Inside me, my heart's racing. This is so incredible. 
I don't really know what to think. Does he remember being Steve? What changed? He looks up at me. I don't know, Jake. It's a fucking lot to process. Yes, it is. Look, it's late. I'm bloody knackered. Let's get to bed. I'll sleep on the sofa tonight. Maybe sleep will help me take all this in a bit better. Okay, Dave. That sounds good. Do you still want me to call you Dave? Or Steve? I don't really know. It's what you want that's important. I don't know either, Jake, to be honest. I can remember things, being here, but I don't really remember being too different at all. Not being me, being Steve. So let's keep it to Dave for now. Sounds good. Jake, are we ever going to find my mum? Are we ever going to find Monica? I don't know, Dave. I just don't know. But if there's anything I've learned with Ostium and everything that's happened to each of us, it's that wherever we are, there's always a chance. Good answer. Night, night. Good night, Dave. Sleep well. I run up the stairs, thinking I'm going to have to shake Dave awake if he's not up already. I find the couch empty when I make it to the top, a piled blanket at one end. Where the hell is he? I then see him over at the window. He's staring at something, eyes wide in astonishment. I walk over to him and follow his angle of sight and discover he's seen the cable car too. Finally, he breaks his stare and looks at me. Who the fuck is that? I have no idea, but we're going to find out. His eyes somehow widen a little more. Are you sure that's a wise idea? Oh, it's definitely not, but... I don't think we can go about our day checking out other buildings while there's someone riding the cable car to the top of the mountain or riding it down to come find us. I'm just not going to feel comfortable going about our business today knowing that we could have someone watching us behind our backs or coming at us without our knowing. You're fucking right, mate. Okay. I am scared shitless and it's the last thing in the world right now I want to do. But you're right. I put a warm palm on his shoulder. I'm scared shitless too, man. Now, let's rip the band-aid off and deal with this. You what? Uh, never mind. I'll explain it on the way. It's a very enjoyable ride. Rising up and up, ever higher. Getting to look back and down on this very strange island. It's surreal. Not as surreal as it could be. I spent time here before. No lay of the land, so to speak. But seeing it from way up here, it's pretty trippy. And beautiful. Looking down at all the little buildings below streets and lanes between them like arteries and veins only there's no lifeblood here it's all dried up, desiccated and that's when I fucking see something I can't believe it can't be real can it I know I've been hearing some weird shit those goddamn explosions who knows what they're about could there be someone else here somehow This place definitely had the Ostium vibe when I arrived. Polar opposite to how it was before. But I'm seeing the proof right now. Undeniable. Unless that Eevee's driving itself. Okay, for just a moment. An iota, as Jakey would say. In this place of all places, that's a maybe. A possibility. But I'm not buying it. Not a bit. There's a someone or someone's in that vehicle down there. Looks like they're headed my way, via the cable car station. Let the games begin, I guess. Part of me is happy to know I've got company. And another part of me, a big part, is fucking terrified. I turn around and see I'm not too far off my last stop. I went over the last pylon already, slowing down then speeding up. I got the hang of it now. 
Actually, the end is coming up real fast. I've got a matter of seconds. And I didn't check the instructions on how to stop this flying umbrella. Yes, that's a reference. Look it up. So I dropped the speed down to 5 kph, which is about as slow as it'll go without flicking switches I don't know anything about. Should have done my homework. But it's slow enough for me to make it work. I slide open the door. Holding on to the rails, there's still one heck of a job. <laughs> I'm not taking any chances. The cable car slides into the opening of the station like a Pez candy into a Pez dispenser. Yeah, that simile was fucking terrible. And yeah, you can pick your favorite Pez dispenser. I get ready to leap through the door and onto the platform. Except there's a fucking gate. And it's closed. Time to adjust the plan of attack a little. And now we're out of time. I leap through the doorway, grabbing onto the railing with both hands, which rattles around like something electrified, and throw myself sideways. Once my body's clear of the rail, I let go and twist with it, letting the momentum carry me in turn. I land on my feet, bending my knees. I stick the landing. No sweat. I hold my position for a minute, catching my breath. Then I'm up and moving around. Meanwhile, the cable car has done its revolution and is out the station and on its way back down to the town below. All ready for some fresh passengers. Just fine and fucking dandy. Can't think about that now. They'll presumably be up here at some point, joining me. But I still got some time. I open the door of the cable car station and step into a big room. It's covered and well shielded and insulated. I get the sense of a bunker or fallout shelter. The sort of place an important person in power would need to go during a strike. It's quiet here. Silence is swallowed up, absorbed by the thick walls, not letting anything out, not letting anything in. I stroll down the hallway to solid metal. My footsteps don't echo. It takes us a good long while to find the bloody platform where the cable car is supposed to be. We thought we were doing just fine, trudging along. We could see the big wires that carry the cable cars, even if we couldn't actually see said cable cars. We could see where they came down to earth, so to speak. So we headed in that general direction. We got close, bloody close, so we thought. Then we hit our first dead end. We went back and tried again. Then we found a bloody great big building blocking the way. So we went back and tried again. On the eighth try, we had success. I let Jake lead the way, you know, to absorb any oncoming fire. We step into a sort of waiting room. Jake points out the door. There's some splintered wood around the lock. Yeah, definitely a break-in. Someone probably attacked it with their feet. I look at him in absolute confusion for a few seconds, and then realize what he's going on about. Oh right, gotcha! On the other side of the waiting room are glass doors and they're open. We step through and now we're on the platform. There's a big U-shaped hole in the center where the cable car is supposed to go and turn around. Only there's no cable car right now. But we can hear the sound of machinery. Everything's on apparently and working. Jake is looking up the mountain and points to a distant cable car making its way down towards us. I hope there's no one on that. No, I don't think so. It looks empty from here, and whoever was on it was probably riding it up. It's empty now, all ready for us. Bloody brilliant. I get to the end of the hallway and find another doorway. It's a sliding door. One of those fancy ones where the door slides into the wall and kind of disappears. We didn't have anything like that down below. Makes sense. 
for the big wigs up here to have all the fancy shit. Would I have wanted a cool sliding metal door for the front door of my apartment? Fuck no. But I would have liked the option. I step into the room and it's pretty dark. I can see a few pinprick lights here and there, but nothing that tells me what it is. I can't even make out shapes. I pull out my data pad and find the flashlight option. The darkness is torn apart by a bright white beam, and suddenly I can see what the hell is around me. It's a fucking control tower. Machinery. Everywhere. Consoles. Racks against walls. And I can see many more little lights now. Greens, reds, blues, oranges, and more. I shine the light around, and I see a light switch on the wall. Now why the hell didn't I try that when I walked in? It's a big switch. Almost a toggle. It takes a good bit of effort to lift up. There's a loud, echoing, metallic sound. Like something dropped. Then the room is bathed in light. Wow. Now that's much better. And yep, just as I thought, this is a watchtower. All those conspiratorial ideas we were having way down below were 100% correct. I could now see a single button on one of the consoles is lit up in an orangey yellow. It's thick and attention demanding. Taking the bait, I press on the damn thing. If I thought it was bright before, I find myself covering my eyes as the metallic shutters rattle up and reveal giant windows all around except for the doorway I came in through. Holy shit, I can see everything from here. Literally everything. An almost 360 degree view. I can see down below, way down to the town and the buildings and the many streets. I can look out far to the horizon. Nothing but ocean, and more ocean, it looks like. Though I guess if this is still the Mediterranean, it's all sea. <laughs> Jakey would correct me on that. Sea as far as the eye can see. He'd laugh at that, too. And now I can see the cable car, just about to come into the station. Well, then. That fun time was short-lived. Time to face the fucking music. We don't know how to stop it, so it's all about timing. Fortunately, the cable car is going slow, damn slow. So it's not that big of a deal. We watched as it makes a U-turn, then we're ready by the railing. The door is open, makes it even easier. Whoever used it last has been courteous, or in a hurry. I hop on as soon as I have the chance, and Dave is right behind me, actually running into me. Kind of slip over the far side of the cable car. Then we're out of the station and beginning our ascension. Dave doesn't waste time throwing the sliding door again. That makes things feel a lot safer in here. I walk over to the control panel, looking at the various dials and switches, not knowing if I should do anything. I wonder if there were any instructions. I look around, then below, finding a small cubby underneath. There's a piece of paper there. A page of instructions. I shit you not. Awesome. Dave is at my side as I'm reading how to operate the cable car. Here goes. Hold on to something. Dave does and I accelerate the car to 15 kilometers per hour. When I reach the first pylon, I drop it to 5 kilometers per hour. Then I speed it back up again. Having me focus on operating the car does wonders to make me not have to deal with the fact that we're getting higher and higher and as I might have mentioned once or twice before I'm not a big fan of heights Dave meanwhile is at the far end of the car looking at the window and taking in the splendor laid out below I'm sure it's beautiful but right now I have to focus on operating the cable car you know for our safety and all
I haven't got long. A matter of minutes. I got choices to make. I gotta be quick. Do I fire first? Do I take down whoever I see? Or do I give them a chance? A hope? I don't know right now. It depends if they're pointing anything my way. It depends on who the fuck they are. I draw out my little pistol. I haven't had to use it yet. I hope that streak continues. We're coming into the station now. Right where whoever was riding this car got off before, presumably. We can't take any chances. Jake is carrying out the instructions on the piece of paper. The cable car is coming to a complete stop. He's managed to break off a thin piece of metal from inside the car. It didn't look important. Nothing bad happened when he did it. And now he's got himself a makeshift weapon. And I've got the little gun. I draw it from my pocket and look at it. The last time I used it, it was to kill someone I didn't want to shoot. I hope this time I don't have to use it to kill someone I know I need to kill. I'm standing in the doorway. The cable car has stopped. Whoever's on it must have looked at the instructions. They must be pretty smart, too. Or at least able to read. I can't trust them, though. I make a snap decision and shut off the lights. It plunges the room and the hallway into mostly darkness. With the gun pointed at the opposite end, I start walking. We've stepped off the cable car and can't see anyone on the platform. I feel more than helpless with this pathetic piece of metal, but it's all I've been able to salvage on such short notice. This time I make a hand gesture for Dave to go first. No talking from here on out. We might be heard. Dave nods and walks in front. We reach the doorway that leads to a dark corridor. He steps through and I follow. We stop and wait. It takes a while, but then I hear it. Slow footsteps, coming slower. Dave hears them, too. He starts walking down the hallway. I don't know what the hell his plan is, but I stay close behind him. He must have something in mind. He's reaching into his pocket for something. I can hear the rustling. The footsteps are coming closer now as we draw nearer to the person. They're coming nearer. There's two of them. I can't tell if they're armed. They probably got something. It's your classic standoff. Only I'm really fast at the draw. Fuck. I've already drawn. I just need something to pull the trigger at. I brought out my data pad. My finger is already on the flashlight button. got my data pad out. I don't know who's coming towards us, but I want to see them before I try anything. Before I shoot them, if I have to. I know there's a torch option in the menu. There it is. Got to wait for the right time. We're very close now, and so are they. I turn the light on.
Jake. Monica. Jake. Monica. Steve. Monica. Steve. Mom. Steve. Rocky. God damn it, Jake. You always knew how to ruin an emotional moment. Fuck you very much for that. <laughs> You're fucking welcome, Monica. It's great to see you, too. <sighs> Steve, dear, <laughs> just give me a moment. Jake, before you voice any of your feelings, before you vent what you think of me. Monica? <sighs> d d d not a word. Keep your lovely lips sealed for now. We need to talk about everything, I know. Yes, you're completely right, but first and foremost, I need time with my son. You you okay with that? Yes, Monica, absolutely. I want you to have as much time as you need with Dave. I mean, Steve. Dave? Just don't worry about it. He'll explain it. Um, I'm going to go now. Check out some of these awesome views. When you're done, um, when you're ready, you let me know. Thank you, Jake. That means a lot. Mum, is it really you? Yes, dear. How are you? How are you here? Shh, honey, just come here. Give me a hug. I, I need one really bad. <laughs> okay, me too. Oh god, it's so good to hold you, and feel you, and breathe you in. Samesies. Oh god, I haven't heard that in so long. That's how I know it's really you, Steve. I go by Dave now, Mum. Oh, nonsense. You'll always be my little Stevie. <laughs> Mum, I hate it when you call me that. And I'm serious. Can you be serious for a second, please? Okay. Hit me with it. I'm Dave now, Mum. It's... It's who I've been for a long time. It's who I remember being, as far back as I can remember. Sort of. I do have memories of being here. The Ostium Network? Yes. Is that what it was called? What it is called, yes. It's still here, even if the people aren't. Right. Okay. I can remember bits and pieces, being here before, with you in some of them too. It's been coming back to me, just bloody slowly. Any idea of what's been helping? Has there been a, a certain trigger bringing your memories back? Not that I can really think of. I suppose it's seeing everything here. The different places, buildings I've visited before. Such as when I found my apartment. I knew instantly what my passcode was. It was thrilling. Okay then. I think I've got just the right regimen for you. For the last however many days it's been, I've been making a series of recordings. Some of them. Parts of them I never want to ever have near your precious ears. I'm sure there's a good reason for that. Oh, honey, there sure is. And you're not going to find out. We're leaving it at that. Capiche? Capiche? It's a saying. Italian, I think. But it became popular in the English vernacular in the late 20th century. It means understand. Get it? Oh, yeah. I forgot how into that period you were. Could barely drag you out for a bite to eat or even a drink. You couldn't get enough of it. Hey, I'm starting to remember it. All that time you spent in your apartment, working and working, learning and revising. 
I never bloody saw you. <laughs> yeah. I was in pretty deep. I fucking lost it there. Kinda. <laughs> you know what? What? I just had my first solid memory. It came back to me all of a sudden. Of talking to that bloody photo of the two of us. Sitting in my living room talking to it. Because you were too busy. <laughs> That's just fucking hilarious that is. And <laughs> so bloody you. I'm glad you think it's funny. To me, it's kind of sad. Actually, very sad. I'm sorry, St- Dave. I'm sorry I was like that. Treated you like that. That wasn't right. Oh, it was fine. I think I was doing that as more of a personal joke, to be honest. So I could take the piss with you later. And thank you for calling me Dave. I know it must be hard. I know... I know I have my own story to tell. My own history of how I ended up here. About what happened to me over all this time. Dave. It's okay. Take your time. You'll get there. I I don't want you to push yourself, dear. You've been through so much already. Take your time. And maybe, hopefully, those recordings will help bring your memories back. Yeah, let's hope so. But how did you end up here? In the same Ostium network as us, of all places. <sighs> that, my dear, is a long story. There's also recordings of it. But to cut a long story short... Sorry to interrupt. That expression, it's having an effect on me. Was that something you usually said when you didn't want to talk for too long? No, honey. That expression was totally you. Is totally you. You'd say it like every day. You were always in a hurry, needing to get to your next class, your next job or chore. You hated the idea of hanging around and chatting for too long. Bloody hell. I sound like a right bore. Not completely. Once you clocked off for the day, which wasn't really applicable here. We never clocked in or clocked out, technically. But come dinner time, you were done with the work side of life and switched over to relaxing and having fun. That's when you become the opposite of a bore. An E-Rob? A what? An E-Rob. It's the opposite of a bore. Or bore spelled backwards. Oh my god. I've missed this so much, Steve. I mean, Dave. It's okay, Mum. You can call me Steve. I'll allow it. Oh, will you? Well, how nice of you, fine sir, to allow your mother to call you by your given name. The name I chose for you. I remember finding you that day in the building I was working on like it was yesterday. All alone. You found me in a bloody building? I don't remember anything about that. Well, you were a newborn, but it's all in the recordings. You were just lying there in the basket, wrapped in a blanket. All baby fat and cuteness, calm and content. (laughs) I was smitten the second I saw you. I'm so happy I found you. (laughs) I'm so happy to be here now, with you. I feel so bloody fortunate. Me too, love. Me too. Are we... Are we good? Yeah, we're, we're, we're all right. And it's going to get better. Much better. Especially if those recordings are as bloody amazing as you've been implying. Oh, honey, you have no idea. Come on down the hall here. I've got just the place for you to listen to them. So, your data pad should be all synced up now, and you can start listening to those recordings whenever you want. Fantastic, Mum. Cheers. Have at it while I go have a heart-to-heart with Mr. Jake Fisher. Mum, if it's any consolation, he has forgiven you already, after everything, in his own Jake way. Thank you, Dave. Thank you for telling me that. You're welcome. And one other thing. He still really loves you. A lot. (laughs) Really? Okay. Good to know. Oh, 
Jesus. What the fuck happened? Uh, the minute it was all normal, I, I was talking to Jake. I was going to tell Jake. I, I was going to tell Jake. And then there was a blinding red light and... What? He's... He's gone. He's fucking gone now. Just like that. Not even a goddamn goodbye. I'm sorry, Monica. Whatever you went through, I know I I know you had your reasons. Trust me. I've done stuff like that before. Stuff? That's what this is? Stuff? I want you to know. What do you want me to know? Oh, hey, Monica. Didn't know you were coming. The fuck you didn't. There's no one else here, Jake. You could have heard me a mile away. You're right. My mind was just on other things. I'm sorry, Jake. Sorry to jump on your back right away. I don't know what you've been through after... after the blackness took you. It couldn't have been good. Like anything fucking ever is with Ostium. But, um... I could use a hug. Me too. Warning. Incoming hug approaching. I don't know. I didn't know. mean to. <laughs> you go first. Thank you, Jake. But not this time. I think I need to get your take first. See if there's anything you need to get off your chest. You tell me whatever you want to tell me. Thank you, Monica. I've had a lot of time to think about everything that happened between you and I, and I felt I felt angry, very angry, and cheated and lied to. You were, and I'm very sorry. Let me just let me finish, please. I need to get it all out. If I keep stopping, I don't know if I'll be able to. Sorry, Jake. Okay. I felt the whole thing between you and me. The sex, the closeness we felt. It made me wonder if you did it all for nothing. Just to try and get to Steve. And you didn't give a shit about me. I felt used. It all felt pointless. And I started wondering what the hell I was even doing in Ostium. With you. Not that I could do anything about it. I was fucking stuck there. Just like you. With you. Again, Jake. I... God damn it. Fucking shut up, Monica. Got it. Thank you. You're gonna want to hear the next part. So, I had all these feelings and... Had them all flashing before my eyes in those last moments. I knew what you had done. I knew how you had done it with those... Crazy Michael Jackson gloves. <laughs> what? That's what they look like to me. I almost would have preferred being hit over the head repeatedly. Though I'm guessing those gloves had some ability to mess with my mind, too. So at the end there, I wanted to get back at you. It felt... It felt fucking great to tell you when you asked me to come back to Ostium. To let you know I was abandoning you for a change. Part of me knew I had to do it, because of the physics of it all. But another part of me wanted to do it. And then, when you stepped through, that's when it finally felt like a mistake. Like I'd made the wrong choice. But it was too late by then. Also, I thought I was going to die. Some really weird shit happened to me after that, with the blackness. 
I still don't really know what. Don't understand it, that's for sure. I made recordings, tried to process it in some way. You can listen to them if you want to. I don't really want to go into it all again. It was a pretty wild and crazy trip. But I came out the other side alive. I survived. Somehow. I made it back to Roanoke. Somehow. And that's where I found Dave. I came out of that blackness changed, Monica. I had more control over Ostium. Over what it could do or try to do to me. To us. I could hold the blackness back with no problem. Whatsoever. It wasn't even a threat to me anymore. It isn't a threat, still. And I could make my own doors. My own Ostiums happen. I still don't understand the hows or even the whys. I just know what I'm able to do. I knew where Dave and I had to go next, and we found something. A something. Something powerful and deadly. Dave will tell you at some point, or you'll hear his recordings, of when he first came face to face with this entity. How it terrified him. Terrified me too, when I first saw it. But before that, I got us to that house in Fort Bragg from before, before it could be there, and before those men arrived. What? Men? The ones you sent through. The ones you thought were all dead. I was able to save them, Monica. I sent them through a door, another door. It took them back to their time, their place, their Ostium network. Their own timeline? They're alive? Yes. They, they all made it through the door. I don't know if that does anything to the Ostium Continuum, and I don't fucking care at this point. They made it through. They live, and you didn't hurt them. At all. It's not on you anymore. Oh my god, Jake. That's fucking wonderful. Whatever possessed you to do it. Thank you. Thank you. You're welcome, Monica. I still want to know what the whole story behind that is. What your whole story is. Yes, yes, you will, Jake. I promise. I was going to tell you at the end there, but once that artifact fell on the number, everything went white and you disappeared and I was all alone. Okay, good. I can go with that. But there's more I need to say. Okay. It's about Dave. It's about Steve. Okay. When we got out of Ostium, when we came here, I couldn't believe I'd managed to do it, to open a door and get us both here in time, before that thing got to us, and then it was just the two of us in this place, all alone. Or so I thought. And that's when Dave started remembering things about this place. Things he shouldn't know. Unless there was uh, more to his story than he was telling me. So there was that. And then there was the white-hot anger still in me over what you did to me. How you treated me. I had to, Jake. For Steve. I know, Monica. But... You need to let me finish. Please? I'm sorry, Jake. Again. Those two cocktails of emotion, they started to mix. Coalesce, I guess. And diffuse, in a way. You said Steve was your son. Yeah. I know. I know. He is your son. I got that. I get that. And I suppose it was something that stuck with me. So when I met Dave, got to know him a bit, things started to make sense. For perhaps the first time in all my time in Ostium, and out of it. I didn't know for sure, not by any means. But in the back of my mind, there was a growing possibility. A maybe taking shape and becoming something more substantial. What if? But it was just in the back of my mind, nothing concrete. At the same time, I was thinking about you. Not just what you did to me. I was sort of over it already by that point. (laughs) Hey, no need to look so shocked, Monica. I just, uh... (laughs) I just did not expect to hear that from you, Jake. Well, it's true. Also, (laughs) that was a great pun we both missed. You know, shocked. 
Anyway, when I got here, after it all kind of settled in that we were in Gibraltar, but a different Gibraltar to the real one, and we were all alone and had no clue what to really do next, I started thinking about you, trying to put myself in your shoes, what you went through, what you must have been thinking. I still don't know the whole story, your background with Ostium and before it. I know, Jake. I will tell you, I... I ended up making my own recordings. What I thought of as personal recordings that I didn't ever plan for anyone to ever hear. Except me. And Dave is listening to them right now. And I'll probably be letting you listen to them too in the near future. I didn't realize how much I needed to say to get off my chest. Sorry for speaking for a bit here. That's fine, Monica. I want to hear your side too. What happened to you? Well, I'll keep it short, because I know you're not done with what you gotta say. I... I don't think I realized just how much had happened to me. How much I'd been through from the beginning. Here. Or the other here. Whatever. And then losing Steve, and then going after Steve, and meeting you, and looking for Steve, and going through so much. I had a lot I wanted to talk about. It felt good to say it. Real good. And I guess it was a good thing I recorded, too, in a way, because I don't have the fucking patience to spend hours and hours telling my life story to the two of you. There, I'm done. Thank you for that, Monica. I know it can't be easy, saying all this stuff after everything you've been through. I know it's a lot. A hell of a lot. And you had your reasons for doing what you did. It was Steve. It was always about Steve and for Steve. I obviously haven't had any children, but I can try and imagine what that must be like. To care for someone so completely and unquestioningly. It's true. You know the expression about how you die for someone you love? As someone who really likes the fuck out of living, the thought of kicking the bucket is something I just never like to think about. I know I'm not the only one. But after finding and making Steve mine, raising him and dedicating my life to him, it became obvious I would willingly sacrifice myself for him, throw myself in front of a moving vehicle while pushing him out of the way, give up my life to save his, no question. And that's never changed. I can understand that, Monica. You're faithful and dedicated when it comes to things you care about. And when you were using those gloves on me, everything just started falling apart. And I was so angry because I didn't understand. But now, after taking my time, because I don't like to just dive in and decide on something based on a whim, as you know. I sure do, Jakey. Jakey, I don't think I've heard you call me that before. I like it. I'm pretty sure you have, Jake kind of a more recent development, but I'm pretty sure you were there. No, it's not ringing any bells. It's something i definitely take notice of. Are you sure? I could have sworn. Oh no, you're right, Jakey. I only started calling you that when I was hearing your voice in my head while I was trying to get myself the fuck out of Ostium. Voice in your head? Don't read too much into it. The stress I was under, hearing you seems perfectly logical. It's all in the recordings. Okay, then. Well, I do like it. Feel free to call me that any (laughs) time. Will do. Anyway, after thinking it all over, thinking it real hard, what you did was understandable. Your one goal, no matter what, was to find and protect Steve. That was always what you were doing, right? Yes, Jake. It was. But also, what happened between us? It did help me do what I thought I needed to do. What I thought was the right thing to do. But it wasn't just that. The sex was... A natural act. It happened because we were both consenting and willing, regardless of what I thought I needed to do to get to Steve. And... Over that time, you became important to me. A lot more important. I didn't ever plan on that happening or expecting it to happen. 
and you were having those nightmares, and I thought it could help. But if I could go back and change all this from happening again, I don't think I would. Because it wouldn't be the same between us. What happened between us wouldn't happen the same, and and I don't want that. No, I don't want that either, Monica. I, I fucking love what happened between us. It was magical, and special, and fun, and extremely pleasurable. It was fucking... It is fucking great, if it still is, between us. I still want it to be. Do you, Jake? Yes, Monica. Very much so. Jake, I think I... I love you, Monica. After everything, that hasn't changed. I knew I was falling in love with you. And I know I still love you now. (laughs) Jake, that's beautiful. And thanks for cutting a girl off when she's about to say it. Weren't you taught any manners? I fucking love you too, Jake. And I still love you. Can I get a kiss? Shall we go check on your son? Yeah, I think so. He's had enough time to get caught up. So is he Steve or Dave to you? He says he wants to be Dave for now, though he said I could call him Steve. But that may change in time. I don't know. Once he remembers his whole story and tells it, Things may change, and he'll always be Steve in my heart. Oh, and one more question. Please don't hit me after I ask this, but if he's your son and he looks maybe five years younger than me, ten tops, how old does that make you? Ah! Okay, I deserve that. Outside on the street. Above me is a clear blue sky, a warm sun shining down. It feels fucking glorious, but I'm not really appreciating it right now because I'm back on the rock, part of the Ostium network once again, and I'm totally fucking alone. Again. Bloody hell, Mum. You've been through a lot. And I thought I was the one who'd had the wild ride. Runs in the family, apparently. And it sounds like we're about at the end of your little adventure. Wait a minute. What is this place? Where the hell did you leave me, Mum? It looks like... Well, I don't know. Like I'm standing in the control tower at Gatwick. Only there's no planes. And no one's here. And everything's turned off. Yeah, makes perfect sense. After all, we are at the top of the rock of Gibraltar. Where else would you plonk your HQ? Views in every bloody direction, no? So let's see here. What looks like it might be the on button? Okay, these look like different workstations. They're all pretty much the same. A chair and a panel of some sort. I suppose there's a secret and logical way to activate them. 
So if I wanted to be the main one that runs them all, the big boss, where would I be? How about opposite that doorway over there? So, all the way over here then. All right. This one does look bigger than the other ones. Let's have a gander then. Where would I put the power button? Let's try running the hands along the surface. Maybe I'll feel something and... Nope. Does sod all. Anything underneath it? Or on the floor, maybe? Oh, two no's there. Okay, Dave. Let's try some lateral thinking here. Outside the box, as the cliche goes. So, it's the future here, right? Obviously. So, this is some very futuristic technology. Not your garden variety personal computer. And all the workstations look the same. A flat, shiny surface. No apparent buttons or switches or toggles or anything. It's blemish free. Sort of reflective. Meaning it's not actually for typing on or even touching. Okay. Yeah, makes sense. So, what is it for then? Come on, brain. It's. It's. It's for projecting. Perhaps. Eh, I think you might be onto something there. Yeah. Projects up, perhaps, to just above. Right in front of my mug. Yeah, right. That does make sense. So if that's the case, I need to figure out how one activates it. Um... Computer on. Activate systems. Power on? Power up? Nope, not working at all. Well, if this is some sort of projection and I actually wanted to use this right now, I'd lift my arms up and stick my hands out like this. Holy fucking shit! I can't believe that worked! It is projected! I was bloody right! It's just like that film that Mun made me watch. The sci-fi flick with, uh, what's his name? Um, oh, uh, don't tell me. Uh, Tom Cruise. Yeah, that's it. And it was called, uh, Mental Drumroll Please? Uh, Minority Report. Yes, we have a winner. And the crowd goes wild. That was it. I can remember that distinctly and fondly, I might add, in my mum's apartment. Far below where I now am. Both on the sofa with... Maybe popcorn? I can't quite remember. Doesn't seem quite right. But if anything would have popcorn, seems like this place would. And... 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 Oh my god! I just had an actual memory from here. With mum. It's clear and solid in my mind. Like it really happened. Because it did! It did really happen. I was here with her before, and it's all starting to come back to me now. Oh, this is so wonderful. Fantastic. Anyway, let's get back to this mainframe we just hacked into. Well, sort of. So what have we got here? Some drop-down menus? Your basic introductory layout for when you first get in? What's this here at the end? Windows? As in Microsoft? I bloody doubt it. And when I hit the drop down, we get one option open. Let's give it a shot. <laughs> Holy shit, the shutters are all opening. All around me. Good job I'm not a vampire. I'd be a pile of ashes by now. Unbelievable. I can see all the way down the mountain. It's incredible. Gorgeous. 
Also can't deny the fact that I feel considerably like Big Brother sitting up here in my tower. Oh look, here come Jake and Mum. Hiya guys! Hi Dave. Looks like you found a way to open things up here. You better bloody believe it. I got the computer system working. Look! Looks a lot like Minority Report. That's exactly what I thought. I remember that film, Mum. Us two seeing it together. That's great, dear. I love that movie. You know when the movie was made, the tech didn't even exist yet. But the guy who came up with the concept patented it and then invented it. And then it was real. Really? Yep. Ah, uh, Jake. You never fail to disappoint. Nerd alert. <laughs> I try. It looks like you two patch things up then. Judging by those hands holding each other. God, that's a bloody weird way to say it. Yes, Dave, we did. And that was fucking weird. So did you find anything else out with the computer display? No, I haven't had the chance yet. I just worked out how to lift up the shutters, and that's as far as I got. I did it by pressing that button over there. Oh, shit. <laughs> Didn't see that one. Would have been a lot easier. Anyway, let's have a gander. Look at that menu. Mainframe. Sounds important. You think? Okay, let's see. Gives me one option. Access. And... Voice authentication required. Um... Let us in, please? Access denied. Voice authentication required. Monica Chase, Ostium Network. Access denied. Voice authentication required. Go on, Jake, have a go. I know it's pointless since you're the last person to ever end up here, but what can it hurt? Okay. <clears throat> Jake Fisher. Um, Ostium Network. Access granted. Welcome, Jake Fisher, to the Ostium Network. Oh my bloody god! What the fuck, Jake? Hang on a second, Dave. Un-fucking-believable. <clears throat> Who am I, computer? You are the creator, CEO, and president of the Ostium Network. President? Person in charge. Boss, head honcho, overseer, superintendent, governor, controller, supervisor. Do you require further definition terms, Jake? Um, no, no. No, thank you. That's, that's quite all right. That voice, it sounds familiar. Um, computer, do you have a name? Yes, if you did not ask me for it in the next... 37 seconds, I was going to tell you, regardless of any questions you had, or were currently asking me, it's the polite thing to do. I, uh, I apologize. You're completely right. By, uh, what name would you like to be addressed? Zhang. Zhang. Okay, Zhang. Pleasure to meet you. And you, Jake Fisher. Though we have met and conversed and interacted on many previous occasions, nevertheless, I appreciate good manners. Therefore, 
a pleasure to meet you too. Zhang, Zhang, I, I, I know that name. Yes, Monica Chase. You do know me. We have met on one previous occasion, as I have also met you, Stephen Chase, on a previous occasion. What? It's not ringing any bells. The interview. Yes. Well done, Monica. That is correct. The only time we have met is at the Five Elephant Kreuzberg in Berlin. Yes. Affirmative. Except, there's a big fucking problem. Oh, and what is that? You're not a real human being. You're a fucking computer, artificial intelligence, wh- whatever the hell you want to call yourself. Ah, uh, I see why you have Ed. No, you are wrong. What? Am I missing something here? Is there a person behind the curtain somewhere? If only you would allow me to explain. It's okay, Jung. Monica's been through. Well, we've all been through a lot. Today, especially. Please excuse our behavior, and please do explain. Thank you. Ah, yes. The three of you meeting today after so long. Understandable. Very well. Let me please explain in one succinct sentence. I was never human to begin with. What? Yes, Stephen, or Steve, as you prefer to be called. When we met in Paris at Le Deux Magots a week before your mother's interview, for your interview. But I have no memory of that. I have no memory of you. Ah,、uh, yes, your amnesia. Again, understandable. What if I was to tell you at that cafe? I recommended you order the hot chocolate. You were hesitant, then you tried it and proclaimed it the most exquisite beverage you had ever consumed. And I am quoting you there. Oh my God! I do remember. I remember it all now, just by you telling me. Bloody trigger! It's all there now. A few blocks from the Seine. Yeah, it's all there. But. I know for a fact I met a person, a real person, Kiao、uh, Zhang. Ah, that is where you are in error, Steve Chase. You met me, Kiao Zhang, in my android form, my mobile form. You're bloody kidding me. No, I am not. I am being perfectly candid with you. The person you and your mother saw and interviewed with was me, but not completely. It was my android body, which part of my conscious had been downloaded into—a sort of remote drone, if you will—that allows me to control and manipulate it from any distance across the world, across multiple worlds, in fact. You were never talking to or interacting with a human being. It was me, Jang. Holy fucking shit! I thought Austin was sci-fi enough, but this, this is a creation of Jake Fisher. What? Yes, Jake Fisher created me. However, I am fully aware that you are not that Jake Fisher, Jake. You are not the Jake Fisher of this instance of the multiverse. Just as I know you, Monica, and you, Steve, are not either. You are all from a different timeline, and now, somehow, you have ended up in this one, my timeline. But this is most certainly a good thing, for I was getting rather lonely. Jong, how do you know we're not the right versions of ourselves that are supposed to be here? Um, sorry, mate. Could you rephrase that in a version of English I can understand, please? It is a valid question, Jake Fisher. 
Stephen Chase, your friend is asking how I know you are not the original Jake, Stephen, and Monica, who have always been here in this timeline, in my timeline. Well, the answer is simple. Could we get that answer? Certainly. I was just waiting for someone to ask me. I know you are not the Jake, Stephen, and Monica of this timeline, because they are all dead. What? An expected response. I apologize. I do not know for certain if they are all dead, but I suspect they are. By all, do you mean、uh, the other Jake, Steve, and me? No. Oh. By all dead, I mean every person living in this timeline of the Ostium Network. All of them. As I said before, I am not certain they are dead, but they are all gone. Okay, you two stop talking for two ticks, Jean. Please give us a story on this. I cannot do that, Dave. Or would you prefer? I cannot do that, Dave. What the fuck? It's not bad, actually. Thank you, Jake. But my imitation is not as good as yours. Yeah.、Um, how do you know I can do a Hal Nine Thousand impression? Because of your recording. My recording? Yes, your recording. To Dave. Who is really Steve? Again, I repeat, what the fuck? You've heard that recording? I have that recording. Why do you have that recording? I have all your recordings, Jake, as well as Monica's and Stephen's, recorded under the nom de plume David for the Gill Attenborough Windsor. Do we really want to know why?、Mm, I, I don't think so. I have all your recordings because while there are an infinite number of timelines where the Ostium Network exists, there is only one artificial intelligence. There is only one Jang. How can you possibly know that? I just do. A perfectly human answer, but I know you will not deem that an acceptable response. Nor if I was to say that it is a gut feeling or anything to that effect. Therefore, let me explain from the point of view of an AI, my processor, my core. If anything were to be identified as my heart, my brain, and possibly my soul, you would find it, if you could find it, very deep within this island. Not at the nano level, not at the molecular level, not at the atomic level. But at the quantum level. Holy shit! Care to elucidate what you mean by that, John? Why would you be asking me, Mr. Jake Fisher? You created me. I apologize. That was mean. I know it is not the Jake Fisher standing here right now in this timeline that put me together. Is anyone here familiar with how a quantum processor works? I could lie and say yes, like I know what the fuck I'm talking about, but I really don't. They taught us a little about quantum theory, but nothing I'd feel confident spouting back to a quantum AI. I'm a little familiar with quantum theory, but why don't you make everything crystal clear for us? Thank you, Jake Fisher. I will attempt to do exactly this. It involves the quantum entanglement principle. Are you, Monica, and Stephen familiar with this principle? A little, though I'm pretty sure Dave isn't. But why do you assume Jake knows? The Jake Fisher from my timeline, the one who created the Ostium Network, was a gifted genius and excelled in most of the sciences. Quantum theory was one of his favorite subjects. Okay, so what does that Jake have to do with this Jake? Based on Jake's recordings, I have deduced that Jake is familiar with the quantum theory. Well. Well, what? Are you? You want me to answer truthfully? Uh, fuck. Yeah, I guess so. 
then yes, I am familiar with quantum theory and the quantum entanglement principle. Is that one of your obsessions? Yeah, unfortunately. <sighs> I see again. Ah, oh, fuck. Would you care to explain the basics, Jake? You guys cool with that? Just fucking spit it out and enlighten us, Jakey. Okay, so the basics of quantum theory are that something can be one thing or it can be another. Like Schrodinger's cat. Isn't it pronounced Schrodinger? I don't know. That's how I've always said it in my head. That's the one where the cat is either dead or alive, and you don't know until you open the box, right? Exactly, but that moment before you open the box, the cat is essentially both dead and alive. Two states at the same time. This is quantum theory. Quantum computers exemplify this. With computers, it's either a one or a zero, right? Sure. Well, with quantum computers, it can be a one or a zero, or both a one and a zero. So three options instead of two, giving it way more computing power. Quantum computing power, measured in qubits. Are you having me on? Qubits? <laughs> Sounds like something out of Charlie and the Chocolate Factory. No, it's the real deal. Thank you, Jake. Your elaboration of quantum theory was simple, perhaps even crude, but served to convey the idea correctly. There's no earthly way of knowing which direction they are going. And what about quantum entanglement? Oh yeah, and if your head's already hurting, wait till you hear this. So the basic atomic structure is your proton and neutron, with the electron spinning around the outside somewhere. It's never really in one spot at one time, so it has sort of this ring around the nucleus, like the rings of Saturn. Well, they've observed that an electron in one atom is somehow connected to an electron in another atom, to the extent that you can't just study the individual electron without being aware of the other. And so you have to observe the system as a whole, which is termed a quantum entanglement state. It's also been observed in neutrinos and photons, but they have no idea how it's happening or why. It's a complete mystery of science. That... That is bloody mind-boggling. The parts of it my mind was able to grasp, that is. Bloody mind-boggling. Yeah, what he said. Thank you again, Jake. To put my own existence in simplistic terms, my core, my processor, my soul, if you wish to get metaphysical, exists in a quantum entanglement state to the nth degree. It exists here, in this ostium network, right now. But it also exists in the billions of other ostium networks in other timelines. Therefore, if you wished, though I do not know why you would want to, for you seem such nice people, you could dig down deep into the island and find my core and destroy it, but I would still remain hale and healthy, for an artificial intelligence, that is, existing in those many other states and remain essentially unharmed by your actions. That is truly unbelievable. So you exist in all these other states, all these iterations of the Ostium network simultaneously? Yes, astutely put, Jake. I am one and I am many. Very many. Goddamn. Can we get back to you explaining why everyone in your timeline is dead? I never said they were dead. Deep breath, Monica. Can you explain what happened to them and where they went? That is a much better phrased question. I will attempt to do so. <clears throat> Approximately two weeks. Hang on, hang on, hang on. Approximately? Yeah, Dave's right. You've never been approximate about anything in your life, Chung. Very well, you know-it-alls. Exactly two weeks to the day. If you want to the hour, you'll have to wait three hours, 14 minutes, and 52 seconds. 51 seconds. 50 seconds. Yeah, we get the idea. Please continue. Very well. Two weeks ago, the first explosion occurred. It came without warning or expectation. I applied every form of detection and study I could conceive of to deduce what was happening. 
I arrived at no conclusions other than the understanding that a hole had opened up in this reality. The amount of energy required to conduct such a feat is considerable. I was able to detect where on the island it originated, but by the time someone arrived at the location, there was nothing left other than a feeling of severe static activity, according to the witness. It wasn't until later that we learned there had been two people right in the path of where the opening occurred that were immediately absorbed into the rift, presumably killed. The next explosion occurred two days later, then later that afternoon. With each passing day, more rifts formed, came and went, taking more and more people. Panic set in and people didn't know what to do. It appeared that the only safe place on the island was right here. I told my Jake Fisher this and I believe he told no one else. There was no one to stop them or prepare for them in any way. Graves were made, though no remains were buried. This soon became fruitless Eventually, Jake Fisher, creator of the Ostium Network, was the only person left here. What happened to him? I cannot tell you. It is classified. Can you tell Jake? I cannot tell him. It is classified. Wait, what? But I am me. The same person. Sort of. Surely you can tell me. I am sorry, Jake. I cannot. The other you, the Jake from my timeline, was very specific. I even recorded his message. Under no circumstances, whatso fucking ever, are you to reveal what happened to me. No fucking hint of what I did. Even if... even if another fucking me comes waltzing through one of those holes and comes knocking on your door asking what the fuck happened to everyone you keep your trap 100% shut got it he he really sounds like an asshole he is my superior and creator I have no say in the matter well I do and I'm sure fucking happy we got you Jakey and not that son of a bitch did the explosion stop after everyone was gone? After whatever that other Jake did to leg it out of here? Leg... it... Ah yes, a colloquialism. I understand. No, they did not. They continued and did not alter upon your arrival either. That applies to all three of you. Those explosions. We've been hearing them. They're... bloody terrifying. Yep, I heard them too. Scared the shit out of me. Well then, you will appreciate this next bit of information I am about to give you. After studying every incident I've been able to catalogue with these explosions, I am now able to guess with an 80% accuracy when the next one will occur. Wow, most impressive. So when are we due for the next one? Two minutes. Seriously? Yes, one minute and 55 seconds. And you think with... Each of those explosions, people were sucked in and killed? That is my hypothesis, yes. They may well have survived, depending on what is on the other side of each of these rifts. But the severity with which they have struck indicates they are extremely violent and unlikely to take one to a place of quiet and calm. No shit. But you did say we're safe up here. Yes. And you know when the next rift is going to open? Yes, to within 80% accuracy. 45 seconds now. Nowhere? Yes, again, up to 80% accuracy. Are we able to see it from up here? Like, with a camera or through the window? I do have a few cameras within the vicinity of the next proposed rift, but they are quite distant and always cease working just before the explosion commences. I recommend looking out to the window at the far right in a south-southwesterly direction. So, over there? Yes. Hurry now, you have less than ten seconds. Oh my god! Bloody hell! 
The amount of entropy, energy required to make that happen, to make a rift, rip a hole in reality like that. Uh, Jake, didn't you do that to get us here? Damn, you're right. Zhang, did you... Were you aware of when Dave and I came through to this island? Yes, Jake. I picked up an increase in electrical activity and focused my cameras on that area. I saw the rift, or door as you like to call it, open through reality, bringing you and Steve into this world. Huh. Guess I was right about somebody watching us. When did you say that? Like, right after we arrived, didn't I? I haven't the foggiest of you ever mentioning it. Well, I was thinking of it, at least. Oh, well then. In that case... Anyway, Zhang, how does the opening I created compare with these... Oh, look. It's gone now. Closed up. Yes, the rifts generally close up after a minute. Enough time to pull something through, but not enough energy to keep it open permanently. Which is a good thing. Definitely. It depends on one's intention with these rifts. Well, that would depend on who or what's making them. Precisely. Do you know who or what is creating them, John? No, I am unable to determine this answer. I can sense their arrival. They last on average a minute and two seconds, and then close up and are gone. That is all I know about them. And when you compare them to the one I created? These are much more powerful, larger, Your rift was gone in 12 seconds. It was smaller, considerably less energy. Whatever is making these particular rifts has a superior strength and ability to you. Thank you for clarifying. Not that I was in any doubt. Hey mate, you still got us both through in one piece. Don't feel bad. It was just right. The Goldilocks ostium. Thanks, man. So what do we do now? What's our next move? Good question, Mum. Jake? Why are you looking at me? (laughs) Seriously? Yeah, you're the one who's been the man in charge, making all the decisions since you first set foot in Ostium. And look where it's got you. You clearly know what you're doing. (laughs) But I don't. I've been winging it the whole time, doing what I thought was right. And it's worked. You're alive. We're all alive. Granted, you had nothing to do with me getting through Ostium, but that was all my awesomeness, other than as a pestering voice in my head. What? Don't worry about it. But remember, you're tied to Ostium. You're tied to the Ostium network. Now we understand a little more why. It doesn't make total sense, but it makes a little sense. A different you, from a different time. I don't know if I'd say a different time. You know what I mean. A different existence. A different fucking timeline. That's what I meant to say. But it's still you. You're still important. You're still the one who gets to decide what to do next, and I'd bet my next meal on you already having an idea what that is. Okay, you got me there, Monica. Like you always do. Yeah, I do know what I want to do next. I want to study those rifts. Where they happened before and where they're going to happen next. Try to get a little closer to them. Not too close. No, a safe distance. I'm sure John can recommend how close I can get before it becomes dangerous. Yes, I'd be happy to oblige, Jake. Thank you, because here's the deal. From what we've heard from John, they're not going away. They're going to keep coming, keep happening. They may get worse. They may get more dangerous. I don't want that to happen, and the only way I can do something about them is by knowing more about them. Are you going to use some of your ostium magic on them? What the hell are you talking about? Jake? I need to catch you up on some things, Monica. The stuff that's happened to me. After the blackness came. (sighs) No time like the present. Look, why don't you two toddle off back down to sea level and have a good old chinwag and relive old times and catch each other up? I've got some things I want to talk about with Zhang. Did he say chinwag? Yes, he likes that one. And sounds like a good idea, Dave. We'll let you do your thing, though I do have one more question for Zhang. Yes, Jake? Is there some way we can keep in contact with you, or do we have to come up here every time to communicate? What a silly question. Of course not, silly. Oh, pardon my insult. It seems like such a simple thing. 
I'm just surprised you don't know. My apologies. Over in the right-hand corner next to the window, there are a number of data pads in their charging cradles. Monica, you still have yours, correct? Got my old friend right here. Good. Steve, you also have yours, though if either of you wishes to, you can choose a new one if you'd like. Um, let me think a minute. No, I'll stick with my original one. Mum? I'm very attached to this one. Very good. Jake, you may choose any one of the data pads. Create a login and password for yourself and you will be all set. On each of the data pads, you will now be able to see a new icon named Jan. You may select and converse with me via text or audio. <laughs> Just like Siri. Do not compare me to that inferior piece of pathetic mimicry. I am a raging goddess compared to that piece of antiquated hardware. I'm... I'm really sorry, John. <laughs> Do not worry, Jake. I was making a little joke. I apologize. Yes, there are some minor similarities, but I am far superior in many ways. I know, John. You don't need to convince me. We're all convinced. Come on, Jake. I'll see you later, Dave. Sure, mate. We'll all have dinner together. My treat. Sounds great, hon. See you later. Bye, Mum. <sighs> what a day it's been. It certainly bloody has. And it's not over yet. I plan on putting on a big spread for dinner. Ooh, what's cooking? It's a surprise. Oh, I do like surprises. Like when you bought me that fancy lunch that time at the diner. Bye, guys. See you later. Hey, that food was great. What can I help you with, Steve? That thing you did earlier, when you triggered my memory to come back to me, and it worked. I remembered. Yes? Did you know it was definitely going to happen? That I would remember? I was certain to a 92% accuracy. Pretty sure, as you would say. Good. That's what I wanted to hear. Because I want you to do it to me again. For lots of things. I want to remember as much as I can. And I need you to help me do that. If you'd be willing, I'd really appreciate it. Of course, Steve, I'd be happy to. First, I must ask you a single question. Are you sure you are ready for this? Yes, I'm ready. I want to remember everything. I take a bit more time than expected chatting with Zhang, catching up so to speak, but when I walk back and get on the cable car as it arrives, I feel a new man, a changed man. The jaunt back down to sea level is a quiet one, naturally, because I'm the only bloody one here. But I'm doing a lot of thinking. My mind is opening up like a cliché flower basking in a beam of sunlight, and the memories are pouring in like life-giving water. And now I've got a sour taste in my mouth. Thanks, brain. I enjoy the sunset on my trip down, with a view I never expected to experience in my lifetime. I savour every second of it. I arrive at the bottom and think, Oh shit, they've taken the golf buggy and left me with bugger all. I'm going to have to walk all the way back to the restaurant. Then I see an EV waiting for me. Oh, how nice of them. They must have got me one, or walked themselves. Probably found me one. I hop in, and soon I'm zooming down an echoey empty street, the light weakening and disappearing, and I'm going as fast as I can, because I don't want to get stuck out here in the dark. I do find the switch for some headlamps, and that definitely makes things easier. It's not long before I'm where I want to be. Then I open it as quietly as I can. I can hear Jake and Mum chatting, laughing and even possibly canoodling. Having a bloody good time by the sounds of it. It makes a warm place in my chest, 
to be so close to these two. Honestly, we can be dealing with any old shit going on here and I'd be absolutely fine with these two next to me. They make things so much easier. And they always make me laugh. I suppose that's a reason to keep them around. Well, time to make my entrance. Hi, honey. Dave, good to see you, man. Hi, guys. Sorry I'm running a bit late. I had a lot I wanted to try and get out of Jean. And did you get it out of her? Jake, honey. One, you don't know that Zhang is a she. Two, you don't know what pronoun he, she, or they prefers. And three, that sounds fucking horrible. Please never say that again. As soon as the words were out of my mouth. Yeah, you get the idea. Anyway, uh, Dave, how did it go? Well, first off, it's Steve now. Permanently. Are you sure? Is this what you want? Don't let us or anyone or anything else pressure you into this. If you want to be Dave for the rest of your life, that's perfectly fine by me. By us. Yes, definitely. Whatever you want, man. Thanks, guys. That means a lot. But I had some time to think about it. That cable car ride felt longer than usual, but in a good way. And now I'm ready. Good. I'm very happy for you, honey. Thanks, Mum. I'm ready to be Steve. And I'm ready to tell you what happened to me. All of it? Yes, all of it. You remember it all? With Zhang's help, it's all been unlocked now, so to speak set free in the paddock of my mind and I want to tell you both what happened to me Mm, but first dinner oh yeah it's just about ready come on we need full stomachs for this sounds lovely Wow, delicious. That was a meal fit for a king. I thought you said the same thing yesterday. Well... Plus, your mom helped with this one. Well... Steve, are you saying Jake's cooking is better than our combined cooking? No. Well, which one is better? Yesterday's or today's? Um, how about dessert? Smooth move. Or is that cool move? Why? Because we're having ice cream. Huh? For dessert, we're having ice cream. I don't get it. Ice cream, which is cool because of the ice and being frozen. And hey, wait a minute. Are you fucking with me? Gotcha. (laughs) I'll get the dessert. Are you sure you're ready for this to tell your story? Yeah, I am. I'm sure. I just don't know how long it's going to take. I don't want to keep you two up late unnecessarily. Honey, we're going to stay up as late as you need us to. As late and as long as you need to tell your story the way you want to. To the end. Until you're satisfied. I think we could probably rustle ourselves up some coffee if we need to. If we need it to stay awake. Coffee sounds good does, doesn't it? I don't think we're going to need it to keep our eyes open. Your story is going to have us hooked. Trust me, but coffee would be good. Yeah, it would. Let's eat the ice cream first, and then I'll start boiling some water for coffee. You ready to start, Steve? (sighs) 
Yes. I've been thinking for a bit exactly where I want to start, and I know it has to be at the right beginning. The right one for you, Mum, and the right one for me. That would be when the people in charge first came to me about going through the first door. We'd all been learning and revising and relearning for weeks. Felt like there wasn't really anything left to be learnt. We were just waiting for something new to happen. They even let us go to the Ostium place while it was still being built. It was incredible to actually see the thing we'd been talked to and learnt about for so long. And then one day two blokes came to my apartment when I didn't have any classes. Completely unannounced. Scared the shit out of me, to be honest. I didn't really know what to do, what to expect. I offered them tea, with a straight face, mind you. It was bloody hard. Do you remember their names? Um, they just gave me their surnames. Let me have a think. Uh, Keelan and Takaya. Yeah, that was them. You sure? Yep. Positive? Yes. Why? It's, uh, it's not important right now. Keep going. Okay. So before they'd even tried the tea, the Keelan bloke said we're ready to have someone go through the ostium door, and we want it to be you. I was, well, I was gobsmacked. Couldn't bloody believe it. Out of all the people in Gibraltar, I'd been the one chosen. The chosen one, essentially. We all knew it was going to happen eventually, didn't we? Yes. We were all wanting it to happen. It's what we'd been working towards. All that learning and revising and practicing and classes and teachers and waiting and waiting and waiting. And then it happened. To me. I was told right there and then. It was me. I didn't get to decide where or when I wanted to go. That was something that was going to come later. Right now there was one door I'd be going through. To a specific place. And that was it. I had to decide right at that moment. No time to think about it, or have any second thoughts, I suppose. It was decide now, or then move on to someone else. I had to say yes. I'm sorry, Mum, for not letting you know. For not talking to you about it. I wanted to, really I did, but they wouldn't let me. It's okay, honey. I know it was something you couldn't say no to. I don't think I could have either if it had been me. But as soon as I found out... I know. I know because they told me. After I said yes, I'd do it, no matter what. They said I had to keep it a secret. That it was going to happen that afternoon, leaving me barely any time to prepare for it, both mentally and physically. But that's how they wanted it. In case I never came back. Which is sort of what happened to me. If they lost me, they wanted to have their cover story ready for when the shit hit the fan. I didn't fully realize this until later. Until I was an ostium and couldn't go back. They told me I couldn't bring anything with me, other than the clothes on my back. So dress warm, they said, knowing full well where I was going, while I hadn't a bloody clue. And then the time came. I'd spent those precious few hours at home just savouring where I was and trying to control the building excitement in me. It was just the other one this time, Takaya, and he took me away in one of the EVs to that special building I'd never been to before. The one we found and checked out? Yeah, that one. I might have passed it once or twice before, but it was strictly off-limits to the likes of us, so it never entered my head to try and see what it was like inside. But they took me through, checked me in, assigned my name a few times on some data pad, and then was taken deeper inside. They gave me a new data pad. I'd left mine at home, as I'd been instructed to do. This new one, they said, wouldn't have all the same abilities as my usual one, but it would allow me to do video and voice recordings, which is mainly what they wanted me to do, to document everything that was happening to me, everything I was experiencing in Ostium. This told me pretty clearly, without them saying in so many words, that they had no bloody clue what it was going to be like for me on the other side, in Ostium. And once I went through that one door I was supposed to go through. It wasn't exactly encouraging to hear this. But my heart was already thumping like a John Bonham bass drum. And I was sweating and thankful they didn't take my blood pressure. Because it would have been through the roof. This was just part of the plan. Part of the mission. Part of my job that I was about to start doing. My real job. Everything before had been practice. Training. 
getting me ready. This was the real McCoy, the actual thing I was here to do. I knew it was a monumental first step, just like Neil Armstrong on the moon, just like those people who went into space for the first time, just like those first people who took to the skies, just like those people who decided to go into the unknown and find out what the fuck was going on on the other side of the hill. Now it was my turn. The first person in Ostium. <sighs> One small step through a doorway, and voila, history made. I was ready. And even if I wasn't, I told myself over and over, a mantra, that I was ready, whether I liked it or not. It was then they finally bloody told me where and when I'd be going through that one and only door. They told me that door would have a number two on it. The door that had a number one would be my living quarters, with a place to sleep, a toilet and shower, and a kitchen stocked with food. Anything and everything I could need, essentially, according to them. They showed me a digital map of the place. Mum and I had been there with everyone else when we would first had that chance to check it out, but things weren't finished yet. A lot of stuff was still being built and organised, so the map felt completely different to that place we'd been to. They showed me where I'd be arriving, where my home base was going to be, and where door number two was. I asked them why I couldn't have this nifty map on my datapad. They said my new datapad was empty right now, because they weren't sure what would happen to any files that were on there once I went through the door to Ostium. They thought it would all get wiped or corrupted. I then asked them how they expected to get all these recordings they wanted me to do back to them. They said there was a specific contingency plan in place upon completing my mission. In the cupboard under the sink at the very back, stuck to the top, was a box. Inside were specific instructions about what I was supposed to do once I'd finished up with everything. They talked about it as if it was going to be real easy, like a stroll down the lane, having some lunch in the park, feeding the ducks, and then coming home. All done and sorted. No problems. I didn't believe them for a second. But I knew I was too deep in it already and couldn't turn back now and change my mind. I wouldn't turn back now. Finally, they told me what I'd find on the other side of door number two. I was travelling to the year 1587, to an island called Roanoke. They didn't really need to give me the details. I knew the story, the history already. It was part of all that training. They knew that and didn't bother going into any further detail on the subject. They told me I was to search the area for a whole hour, gather as much information as I could, make as many video and audio recordings as I could, document it all to the best of my ability, and then come back to Ostium, have a rest, get a good night's sleep, eat when I needed to, and the following day I was to do the same bloody thing all over again. And after that was done, do it all over once again. Then... After all that, I was to read those very secret and hidden instructions and carry them out. All right then, I thought. Seems pretty easy, but very likely won't be. Almost tedious with how they're describing it. But I was just as shit scared as I had been when they first told me what I was going to do five hours ago. Then they said it was time. I got myself as ready as I could, slipped the data pad into an inside coat pocket that was big enough, and followed them to the room. The room where we found the door to Ostium. Yeah, that one. For the first time in my life, I knew what it was like to be an animal in a cage. They opened the door to the room and waited, saying nothing. I got the hint and walked in. No goodbye or good luck or anything. They shut the door firmly behind me, spinning the lock in place with a loud clunk. And then they watched me through the glass window, waiting for me to do my thing. <sighs> So I gave them a sarcastic wave and toddled over to the other door in the room. I tried to keep my hand from shaking as I reached for the door handle. I think I did a pretty good job of it. Then turned and opened it onto darkness. That was when I peed myself a little. It was just so black. No indication of anything in there. Just complete and utter night. And as I stepped through, closing the door behind me as I'd been instructed to, all I could think was... Oh shit, I didn't bring any extra underpants. The 
First thing I did when I was on the other side was I pulled out the data pad and checked to make sure everything was working. It was. I didn't really know why I did that at the time, but having thought on it a bit, I believe it was because it was my one and only connection with the Ostium network, with the world I'd just left. When we came through that first time, the door was left wide open and we could all see the way back as easy as pie. This time, once I was through, that door was closed and my way back was gone. Hence the specific instructions once I carried out the mission. It was weird. Bloody weird. Being there completely by my lonesome. But I knew what was done was done, and I was here, and it was all up to me now. (sighs) So I put one foot in front of the other and walked into my new home for a bit. Did you enjoy your stay at the Ritz? You what? Oh, right, yes. It was lovely. Yeah, definitely going back there again. It was just like they said it would be. Comfy bed, fully stocked kitchen, lots of tin foods, a working toilet, which is important when you're eating all those tin foods. But by the time I got there, it was late afternoon. It had already been a traumatic day, to say the least. So I made myself some dindins, cleaned everything up, and then went to bed. I was bloody tired, and I slept like a baby. Next morning I was up early, feeling refreshed and ready to go through that door. It took me a little while to find where door number two was. I didn't have that digital map, so I had to recall it from memory. And I don't have your photographic memory, Jake, so it was bloody hard. Sometimes I wish I had never mentioned the memory thing. But do you? Do you really? And it has allowed for endless jokes, right? Yeah, yeah, just... Get on with your story. All right. Touchy. Anyway, today was going to be the day and I had no bloody clue what was going to happen. Next, I found that map table, which helped wonders to point me towards the right door. But I didn't know if I was going to make it through to the end, if I was going to survive or what. So before I went to the door, I recorded a message on the data pad. A video. For you, Mum. In case things got weird and I never saw you again. I wanted some record, a message telling you what had happened to me. Just something, so you wouldn't always wonder. And something that might give you hope if you were looking for me. (sighs) Because I knew you would be, whether the Ostium network would let you or not. Once that was done, I left. I found the door and it opened without any problems. And I stepped through before I could have any second thoughts. I didn't really know what to expect. I'd been told it was Roanoke in the 16th century but it wasn't a historical period I was very familiar with. More American history than British. Not part of my repertoire, if you know what I mean. The first thing I noticed was how green it was, like the Lake District, where I'd been on holiday a few times with friends. It made me think there must get a lot of rain here to keep everything so green. The ground was all green, lots of green trees, oaks possibly, and I saw this wooden fence in the distance, just as you described it, Jake. But then I saw there was something wrong. Something very wrong. Was it something to do with the trees? Or the wooden palisade? No. No. It was much worse than that. It was something wrong with this reality I was in. I turned my head and Roanoke just stopped being there. It was as if someone had drawn a division line, ending it there like a painting or drawing that just cuts off. On the other side of that invisible line was a metal wall and floor, and this bloody great big window looking out on a reddish-orange desert. It was... it was bloody unbelievable. I think my head started hurting, like when you're looking at two images and one is out of focus, or just off, and starts to do your head in. I wonder what the bloody hell I was looking at, and then saw the spaceship through the window, plonked in the sand like it was a completely normal thing. I didn't have a clue what I was looking at at the time. But you now realize it was the Martian landscape. Right. Though if I'd known, I don't know if it would have made a difference. I was so... (laughs) discombobulated. There was probably a part of me that was pretty certain I was going bonkers. But that wasn't the end of it. I kept swiveling my head to the right, And there was another hidden line of separation, and a new scene. A dark blue ocean, and an old ship. I could just make out the name on the back. The Mary Celeste. Yes. To me it meant nothing. 
It made as much sense as everything else I was seeing. What I did know was that this wasn't right. It was very bloody wrong. Whatever they'd planned on at the Ostium Network, it wasn't this. And if I was scared before, now I was beyond terrified. It's the sort of shit you see and think, well, I'm not going to make it out of this alive, am I? Of course, I'm able to approach it this way now because I did. These three dimensions, for lack of a better word, I'm pretty sure that's what they were, which were all converging in this one place with me in the middle, took up my horizon. So I had little choice but to turn back to the door I'd come through, wanted to get the fuck out of this place. Except the door had closed. I'd made sure I kept it open when I came through, just so I'd have a way out if I needed it. I didn't hesitate. I just turned the handle and opened it, and stepped through, looking to save my ass. I stepped into the blackness, but I didn't end up back in Ostium. I'm sorry. I'm taking my time because I'm still trying to put it all together. I remember what happened, but there's also me viewing it through the lens of time, knowing everything now and knowing exactly what happened. I didn't know for sure for so long. I was in the complete unknown. I'm also trying to put it into words for you now, to make sense of it all. Honey, you take as much time as you need. If you're not ready... No, I am. I know I am. Only if you're sure, man. Maybe just tell and don't worry about how it all comes out. If it's jumbled, we can help piece it together. If it doesn't make sense, we'll work it out. Thank you, guys. <clears throat> okay, then. I woke up and found myself inside a flat. Well, not exactly. It was the shell of a flat. The structure of a building that wasn't finished yet. But even though it was during the day, there were no workmen around. I don't know if it was the weekend, or a bank holiday, or they were all just scarping. There were two things that were very worrying for me. A. I'd completely lost my memory. I didn't remember who I was, where I was, or how I'd gotten there. And B. I was starkers. With hindsight, I'm able to process this a little more. Whatever that place was on the other side of door number two, it was a major fuck-up. Something that was never meant to happen. Something that was never meant to be. A mutation of what Ostium was supposed to be able to do. So I think when I went through, and the door closed behind me, it severed me from Ostium. Probably permanently. <laughs> no bloody clue. When I opened the door again, it was to somewhere else. And somewhere else. London, apparently. And going through there literally stripped me of all my personal belongings. Hence being naked and not knowing who I was. And of course, it was just then that someone walked into the room. A middle-aged black woman. She screamed, I screamed, and we had a long, awkward moment. When I started trying to explain what had happened to me, I think she could hear the pleading in my voice. The earnestness. Or she just had a very good heart and soul. She believed my story. Gave me her coat. Told me to wait and came back half an hour later with some McDonald's, a t-shirt, track bottoms, and a pair of flip-flops. They were a little small, but I was so grateful. I at least remembered how to speak English properly, so not everything was gone. The woman who helped me... It's funny. For the life of me, I can't remember her name, no matter how much I try. Well, she took me to a hospital, St. Stephen's. It's a mental hospital. They were very nice there. I stayed for six months. They did everything they could to try and help me remember who I was. What happened to me? No such luck. After six months, we all pretty much agreed there was nothing that could really be done to get my memories back. They seemed to be permanently gone. And that was that. We were all on the same page about this. They found an elderly couple who were willing to let me stay with them for a bit, so I could get back on my feet. You see, to me, I felt like I'd just forgotten who I was and what I did. Obviously, I'd been someone in London or England and had a job and a family. We thought within those six months my family would have gotten in touch with me. Someone would have been looking. But I couldn't spend the rest of my life in that hospital. So I went to live with Bob and Eileen. After a year I started calling them mum and dad. They didn't mind. They never had children, though they'd always wanted to. 
It had just never happened. Never worked out. So that was my life for a bit. It felt... lovely and routine and normal. I'm really happy you found someone, some life to live. I can't imagine what it must have been like. But I'm very glad you found someone and something to live for. Thanks, Mum. <sighs> Unfortunately, the good times didn't last that long. One year, almost to the day, I swear it was, when I started calling them Mum and Dad, Dad just disappeared. Never came home. No one knew what had happened. And before I could truly wrap my mind around it, Mum disappeared next. I was heartbroken, really destroyed by it all. Fortunately, I had a few friends who were there for me as I went through... Grief, I suppose. All that grief. I'd been legally adopted by Bob and Eileen by that point, and when nothing was learnt about them, they were declared legally dead. There was a will, and they left everything to me. Which was both wonderful and horrible at the same time. I had the house, and I had some money, and I had a job. So I was alright on my own, considering everything. That was when I started wondering if everything that had happened to me hadn't been an accident or a coincidence. If there was some reason behind it all. Or maybe even someone or a group of people. Yeah, I know, it sounds very conspiracy theory, but I was really into the X-Files at that time, and all that sort of stuff. Steve, do you remember when this was? What year? Oh, of course I do, you plonker. It was 1999. Oh my god. Yeah, bloody incredible, isn't it? I went through that door and back in time. I suppose I should be happy I didn't end up in the Middle Ages, or somewhere much worse. But that's when I got the first idea for Emu, Enigmatic Mysteries of the Unknown. I started putting it all together for an episodic podcast. I hadn't seen anything else like it online, so I thought I was doing something new and unique. Got myself a simple website on GeoCities and started uploading the recordings. Started getting a fantastic reception almost right away. It was a little bit weird, honestly. <laughs> and then I found Ostium. Your recordings, Jake. That changed everything. <laughs> and the rest of the story, you know. That's... Well, I'd say that's unbelievable if I didn't know all the steps after that led to you being here with me and meeting back up with your mom. It's a truly incredible story. I've been through so goddamn much. Yeah, tell me about it. I don't know how you did it, but I'm so grateful that you're here now, that we're all together. Yeah, me too. But I'm feeling bloody knackered now. I can hardly keep my eyes open. You head off to bed then. Jake and I can finish cleaning all this up. We'll see you in the morning. Are you sure? Jake? Definitely, man. You get some shut eye. All right then. Night to you all. Love you, Mum. Love you, sweetie. I'm back in the golf cart and driving slowly back to my flat. I'm very tired. That was lovely food. And it definitely feels like a big weight has been lifted off my chest now that I've got my story out. Told them and made myself realize everything that's happened to me. It's been a bloody lot. I don't know where Jake's going to be sleeping tonight, and I wasn't going to ask. It's none of my business, really. But I know him and Mum were shacking up together back in Ostium, and if they want to keep doing that, I'm perfectly alright with it. We're all adults here. And here we are then. God, I can't wait to get under those covers. As they say, tomorrow is another day. <laughs>